What's up, YouTube? Brian here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And on this Thursday for the fourth week of Lent, we're continuing on through the Gospel of Mark. We're talking about the end of the world, or are we? And of course, we've got uh, an incredible quote from uh, Thomas Aquinas. We've got our Lenten catechesis about uh, who receives the benefits of baptism. So let's just get right on into it. All right, so we're picking up in Mark chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. Uh, we're talking about the end of the world, or, or are we? Uh, kind of a fitting reading for the, the situation that we find ourselves in now. Are we talking about the end of the world, or aren't we? So let's, uh, let's just jump right into the word. Mark chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us. When will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise up against their parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now, and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. Be on guard. I have told you all these things beforehand. So is Jesus talking about the end of the world or isn't he? Right here, right now, not really. He's talking about... The destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which occurred in, in 70 AD, and it, it, I think what we can take away, things like let the reader understand, this is but the beginning of birth pains, is what he says at the end of our reading, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. Well... <laughs> Jesus being a, a miracle man wasn't outside of the norm back then. And it, it, it's a thing that really carries itself today. Jesus, we've read all about, haven't we, in this devotion? Jesus healing the sick, giving the blind their sight, giving the deaf their, their hearing back, raising people from the dead. All these things that Jesus has done. And, and today, well, what do we got? We got leg lengthening. 
we're in the middle of a virus pandemic and we've got false preachers who can cure you of ADD. <laughs> I think if we're going to take anything away from this prophecy of a historical event that has already occurred, the takeaway this, it's the church bodies of signs and wonders that are the ones that we are called to avoid, like the plague. <laughs> Now, our writing from Thomas Aquinas, now this is interesting, this is kind of a, and uh, argument and rebuttal, so this is kind of interesting, and, and, I, and I think it ties very well into the reading. The argument against the power of Christ's passion. The devil exercises his power over men by tempting them and molesting their bodies, but even after the passion, he continues to do the same to men. Therefore, we are not delivered from his power through Christ's passion. Aquinas responds, God permits the devil to tempt men's souls and harass their bodies, yet there is a remedy provided for humanity through Christ's passion, whereby a person can safeguard himself against the enemy's assault so as not to be dragged down into the destruction of everlasting death. And all who resist the devil previous to the passion in the Old Testament times were enabled to do so through faith in the passion, although it was not yet accomplished. A further argument is put forth. According to Hebrews 10.14, For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. The might of Christ's passion endures forever, but deliverance from the devil's power is not found everywhere, since there are still idolaters in many regions of the world, nor will it endure forever, because in the time of Antichrist he will be especially active, using his power to hurt to the hurt of men, because it is said of him in Second Thessalonians 2, 9, and 10, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception. Consequently, it seems that Christ's passion does not deliver the human race from the power of the devil. Aquinas responds, God permits the devil to deceive men by certain persons, and in times and places according to the hidden motive of his judgments. Still, there is always a remedy provided through Christ's passion for defending themselves against the wicked snares of the demons, even in Antichrist's time. But if any man neglect to make use of this remedy, it distracts nothing from the efficacy of Christ's passion. I guess that's kind of the age-old, um, well, there's still evil in the world. Okay, cool, there's going to be. I mean, Jesus said in our reading, uh, the, the destruction of the temple, my goodness, how awful those days are going to be for everybody. So bad, in fact, if God had not cut them short, who would stand at the end? And yet he is risen, victorious over sin, death, and the power of the devil. So we trust in Jesus, suffering, death, and resurrection, that whatever temporal punishment befall us for our sinful nature, Christ has redeemed us, and we will stand on the last day, resurrected in a new heaven and a new earth. So continuing on with our Lenten catechesis, we're talking about baptism still because it's just that gosh darn important. So from uh, our Lenten catechesis, what does such baptizing with water signify? We are sunk under the water which passes over us and afterward are drawn out again. These two parts signify baptism's power and work. It is nothing other than putting to death the old Adam and effecting the new man's resurrection after that, Romans 6, 4 through 6. But of these things must, both of these things must take place in us all our lives. So a truly Christian life is nothing other than a daily baptism, once begun and ever to be continued, without ceasing. We always keep purging away whatever belongs to the old Adam, then what belongs to the new man may come forth. But what is the old man? It is what is born in human beings from Adam. Anger, hate, envy, unchastity, stinginess, laziness, arrogance, yes, unbelief. The old man is infected with all vices and has by nature nothing good in him. Romans 7.18 Now, when we have come into Christ's kingdom, John 3.5, these things must daily decrease. The longer we live, the more we become gentle, patient, meek, and ever turn away from unbelief, greed, hatred, envy, and arrogance. 
Faith alone makes the person worthy to receive profitably the saving divine water. Since these blessings are presented here and promised through the words in and with the water, they cannot be received in any other way than by believing them with the heart. Romans 10.9 Without faith it, faith, it profits nothing, even though baptism is in itself a divine overwhelming treasure. Therefore, this single phrase, whoever believes, does so much. You see plainly that this is no work done here by us, but a treasure which God gives us and faith grasps, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. It is like the benefit of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross, which is not a work, but a treasure included in the word. It is offered to us and received by faith. When our sin and consequences oppress us, we strengthen ourselves and take comfort and say, Nevertheless, I am baptized, and if I am baptized, it is promised to me that I shall be saved and have eternal life, both in soul and body. I think I got that wrong at the beginning of the video. Uh, what does such baptizing with water signify? I think tomorrow is um, who receives the benefits. Uh, or was that, ooh, was that yesterday? Did we already go over that? I'm losing it here. Oh, how can water do such great things? Okay, so tomorrow I think is going to be one of the benefits. What does baptizing with such water signify? Shocking, I think, to hear Martin Luther, those baby sprinkling Lutherans. Martin Luther says we are sunk under the water, which passes over us, and afterwards are drawn out again. These two parts signify baptism's power and work. Well, Luther said to be dunked. Look, being dunked is the preferable way to do it, I think. The reason Lutherans don't um, is because we've been told we have to, and we don't have to. Um, but see, well, Luther said that the, the dunking signifies something, so baptism is a symbol. The, the, that particular method signifies what is very plainly, plainly written. We are buried with Christ by baptism into death. We are raised to newness of life. And that's what baptism is a signifies it's not a symbol of anything it is the powerful work of god it is a great treasure and it is something that we do every single day when we drown the old man how by making that sign of the holy cross in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit that cross which was placed upon our forehead and upon our heart in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit that name into which we were baptized this is a daily remembrance of our baptism this is a daily drowning of the old adam that he might, the new man might rise. If you've ever wondered why we do this, that's why. Let's pray. O Lord, by your bountiful goodness, release us from the bonds of our sins, which by reason of our wickedness we have brought upon ourselves, that we may stand firm until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.